Uh, welcome everyone for today's uh, seminar. Uh, so before we start, I would like to introduce uh, Annemarie Friedrich from uh, University of Saarbrücken, uh, who, is, who is giving today's talk. Uh, she studied in, uh, in Stuttgart and Edinburgh um, and was visiting other places and, and uh, also worked at uh, IBM TJ Watson Research Center for some time. Uh, and uh, she works with Professor Pinkal, which many of you might know from his work on various projects, including SALSA, the German valency lexicon, I, I, I should say, or, or pro, pro bank lexicon. And uh, she will tell us something about uh, situation entities. Thank you. So thank you all for coming. I think this is the prettiest room I've ever given a talk in, and I probably have to make sure I'm not looking at the ceiling all the time, but <laughs> it's very nice. So um, as Jan said, I'm going to talk about situation entity types, uh, which are basically um, an inventory of different types of clauses. So whether a clause invokes, for instance, a state or an event or a generic sentence. So this is um, the broad picture. But um, this is all, before I start, I should say, um, based on this book, and actually started out from a theory of discourse by Calore Smith. And um, this is the book, Modes of Discourse, The Local Structure of Text, where she introduces different so-called modes of discourse, which differ by the types of situation entities that they employ. But before I go into detail about this, I want to um, say this is not just my own work. It's what I do for my PhD thesis, which I will finish soon. Um, but all of these people are also involved. Um, first of all, Alexis Palmer, who started this project with me when she was a postdoc in our group, and of course my advisor Manfred. And then also I should point out Melissa and Cleo, who have, are the co-authors on some of these papers, some really motivated students at Saarland. And the rest are people who do most of the annotation work on this project. Okay, so what are discourse modes? Uh, you don't need to read this text. I just put it there, it's not intended to be read. Um, but a text could start with a paragraph like this. Some professor at Saarland um, came into his office one morning and he discovered some exciting results about some experiment. So just telling a story. And this is called the narrative mode in Calore Smith's work. Uh, the next paragraph might be more of background information, saying something like the chicken or egg dilemma is commonly stated as, so giving some background here. So this would be some information, in information mode. And in the last paragraph, the author in this magazine article could say, in my opinion, this should be researched further, and so on. So this is called argument and commentary mode. And the interesting thing here is that these different modes of discourse are actually described by linguistic characteristics. So it's not the topic or the genre of this article. You can really find some linguistic characteristics by which you can say a passage is an information mode or it's a narrative mode. Um, so what is important to remember is that one text usually has one genre. So people who do genre studies say this is a magazine article or this is an encyclopedic article or a news article or something like this. But the theory of discourse modes is complementary to that because it says in a text, it could be a magazine article or news article, the different passages are in a certain mode of discourse. So it actually applies to all genres, and it's more um, general than genre studies because you look at the different passages and find linguistic characteristics, and I'll talk about those in a minute. So one passage has one discourse mode. So what are these characteristics? So the first one that Calore Smith identified, she just read a lot of texts and identified these characteristics, um, are the types of situation entities, and situations are also called eventualities in the literature, so different types of, um, they're called event types or th um, things, and she calls the situations or situation entities which are invoked by a clause, and those have different uh, types. So in a narrative, you could have many states and events. That's what she found. Like came into his office as an event, was very surprised as a state, and so on. In information mode, um, on the other hand, you have a lot of generic sentences or generalizing sentences, like the chicken or the egg causality dilemma is commonly stated as, or to ancient philosophers the question about was this and that, so more things that generalize. And in argument and commentary mode, 
you have a lot of states and events, um, also abstract entities which are things that do not happen in the discourse but which are believed, for instance. So I believe that something should happen. So this something is called abstract entities and also generic and generalizing sentences. Um, the second characteristic are the types of progression that you find in the different modes. Uh, the first one, in narrative modes, you have a temporal progression, which means that if you interpret this, this, uh, the things described in this mode, you think about how are they related in time, and specifically how are they related in time to each other, the things in the narrative. First thing happens, second thing happens, and so on. But this is not the case in information mode. Here it doesn't matter in which temple order things happen because it just gives some general background information. And Calder Smith calls this the metaphorical progression through the domain. So this has nothing to do with metaphors. <laughs> like in text, it just means you think first about this part of the domain that is being talked about and then about the next thing and so on. And in argument and commentary mode, it's the same thing. It's also not the temporal progression that matters. And I think this is already one very important insight because if you know about the work about temporal relation prediction in computational linguistics, they try to just predict temporal relations for everything. And even if it's a passage in like information mode, but that doesn't make any sense because you, if you can't say this is before or after this, it's really background information. But in this kind of mode, it makes a lot of sense to predict whether things are before or after each other. So, for, this is already future work, but we want to model this and say in this mode we want to model temporal relations, but here we maybe want to model how things are related to each other. Maybe coreference is more important in that sense. So I know some of you are working on this. It would be great to have some discussion today or tomorrow about this. Um, there are two more modes that are in Calodia Smith's inventory, and she says it's not necessarily exhaustive, this inventory, but these are the five modes she found. So there's also report mode, which is more or less what you find in news all the time. And here, the relationships between the events and states and the text are also temporal, but they are related to speech time, always from the perspective of the speaker or writer, as you have it very often in news. And the last mode is called description. And when you look, for instance, at fictional texts, you find a lot of um, narrative paragraphs that are, have some description paragraphs in the middle, like describing what the scene looks like. So this is, um, you have a lot of states, like here, like the way the beach looks like, and you have some ongoing events. And there you also don't have temporal progression, but you have metaphorical progression. Okay, so those were the modes. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, please interrupt me at any time. So, this theory of discord modes by Carlotta Smith was not the only one in this, um, and I don't want to explain all the other things that, are, that were uh, thought about, but just mention them. So already in 1989, Egon Werlich in German wrote about text types. Um, so he had also identified something very similar to discourse modes. He has narration, description, also argumentation, and something additional, instruction, because a recipe wouldn't really fit into either of the other things. So this would have a lot of imperatives, for instance. And in France, um, also like two years after Carlotta Smith published her book, uh, Jean-Michel Adam published a book um, also on different types of texts. The difference here is that he has some structure even within like a narrative or something, which the other theories don't um, talk about. Okay, so I already said that. I believe they should be important for temporal discourse processing to find out where you want to apply temporal discourse processing and where not. Um, also, Smith herself wrote a paper where she showed that you need to know the discourse mode to interpret even tense, because even in English you can't say that, for instance, um, the past tense always has the same kind of interpretation once you know it. In addition, you need to know about the um, the discourse mode of the passage. Because in a narrative, if you have something in past tense, this means it happened after the thing that was mentioned before. But in a report mode, this might not be the case. It might have a totally different semantics. And people kind of know what mode they are in, so that's how they interpret tense. Um, it could also be useful for summarization or information extraction. 
uh, because you want to maybe just focus on the passages that are in information mode. So you um, extract the information from that. Or maybe if you work for DARPA, you might actually be interested in the events and not in the background information. So it could maybe be useful to guide um, user-specific summarization. Also, um, Alexis has talked to many people working in argumentation mining, and they believe it could be really useful to identify argumentative passages in text to extract the claims that support some kind of argumentation. So to say I don't want to extract them from a narrative passage, I focus on argumentation passages. Um, also, many people who work like in more the digital humanities or humanities, they want to do fine-grained genre studies, like distinguish many different things in literary studies, and they also uh, believe that this kind of information should be very useful to say writers in that uh, this writer writes more like this, or this genre applied more of that, and so on. Okay, so this is why we started out doing this, working on discourse modes, and now I get to the situation entities. And for this, I have a little exercise. Um, as I said, the situations are the eventualities um, evoked in our case, not, like now, broadly speaking, by finite clauses. And I have four clauses here. And now you may tell me which one is the state. Yeah. <laughs> so the second one is the state. It describes some properties of uh, she, of Mary. So it's not changing here. There's no change of the world. It just says she owns four cats. And states may have endpoints and beginning points, but they usually hold in time. They don't evoke a change. So owning is a state. The next one is easy. <laughs> yeah, this is uh, the event. Mary bought a cat. So in contradiction, if an event happens, it usually somehow changes the world. Something happens. Um, before she didn't own a cat, now she owns one. And uh, generic sentences. <laughs> Sorry? For, yeah. So cats are very social animals. Um, you've probably had a lot of linguistic liter uh, lectures or training, and so people have identified generic sentences as things that refer to a class or kind, which uh, here talks about all the cats. And the last one is easy. <laughs> yeah, so that would be this one. Um, and this is a bit specific to Caloria Smith's inventory of uh, situation entity types because it says Susie often feeds Mary's cats. So the difference between three and four is that four makes a statement about all cats, and three also makes some kind of generalization, but not about all Susie. So it's a generalization that um, is about a particular person who does something regularly. So this is the difference versus event. Here it happens once, and here it happens regularly. So this is um, something that Caloria Smith came up with in the literature, there are many similar inventories that capture more or less um, the same things. Uh, Caloria Smith also has abstract entities, which here in this theory are the clausal complements um, of certain verbs. For instance, um, of the verb know. So Susie knows. This clause is a state. That Mary loves her cats a lot. So this second clause, introduced by that, is a fact because it's an object of knowledge of knowing. It's just really something that Carlotta Smith um, introduced for this theory of discourse modes here. Um, we also have propositions. It's the same thing. The, that the carrot cats also love Mary is the proposition here, the abstract entity. Susie believes is the state. And this is the complement of belief. And that's why we say it's a proposition. So these things, the difference is it's not really happening in the discourse. It's something that someone knows or that um, is believed here. Um, and these things happen a lot in argument and commentary mode, where you say something is the case. Um, yeah, if you have any questions on this, please ask. <laughs> it's, and uh, there are two more types that were actually introduced by Palmer et al. in 2007 in a paper, where they tried the first time to automatically classify situation entity types. And they notice that you also need questions and imperatives because they don't really fit into any of these other categories. Okay. So this um, is the inventory of types that we have. We have states and events with a subtype report for verbs of speech. And those are called eventualities. So all the things that 
refer to specific things, people, or particular um, subjects. Um, the generic sentences and the generalizing sentences are the general statives in Carlotta's work. Facts and proposition are the abstract entities. And as speech acts, we have questions and imperatives. Uh, yeah? Mm. No. <laughs> um, I get to this, but actually only abstract entities, we allow the annotators to also choose one of those labels. So, or even question like, so we allow them for that Mary fed the cats, they can label fact and they should also label event. Because if you abstract away from, from this, if you only see that, it would be an event. And we actually started doing that because annotators just did it all the time. <laughs> so if you tell them to only label this, they will just fail. They will forget about this and say, ah, event. So some annotators were better at always labeling abstract entities and some were less. So to make it easier for annotators, we allowed them to label both things. And I get to this. Um, but in general, except for that, they should be mutually exclusive. Okay, um, also I want to point out that uh, the situation entity types, it's not really the underlying semantics of the event. This would be different uh, types of research. It's really how the writer or speaker chooses to represent things because um, the textbook example from Kalodismus parameter of aspect is the ship was in motion, represents this as a state, and then something else can happen in the foreground. The ship moved is an event, but if you think about what happened in the real world, it's probably the same thing. Um, so this is why I believe that this kind of study is more important for like temporal inferences or genre or literary studies where you want to know how are things represented and what can I, can I infer from this rather than trying to immediately model like some underlying world semantics like um, other approaches would do. Okay. Um, so, let's get to annotation. Uh, in this book, there are many examples, and um, Carlo de Smith has a lot of uh, texts that are annotated with examples, but there's no formal definition, there's no manual that you can apply, so it's all intuition by a linguist, basically. So, Alexis has actually worked with Carlo de Smith um, when she was a student in Texas, and they had a paper on the first automatic classifier for situation entities, which had the first label data set for situation entities with clauses from Brown, mostly, about 6,000 clauses. But they didn't have an annotation manual. They just did this more or less manually, and the kappa was, well, okay, I guess. Um, I should also say at this point that, unfortunately, Carlotta Smith has passed away in the meantime. So for many things, we can't just go and ask her. So Alexis knows a lot because she has worked with her a lot, um, but I sometimes got the question to talk, why don't you just ask her? Unfortunately, we can't anymore. Um, yeah, so Alexis and I sat together two years ago, and we wanted to, again, do improve the classification of situation entity types, uh, because in this work, the accuracies were like at most in the 60s, 60% accuracy, so you can't use this in a pipeline task. So we wanted to find out, like, again, what are the most um, striking differences between these types, because we needed to tell this to annotators to mark this up. So we wanted to simplify the life of the annotators, basically. Um, and this was presented at law. And we actually wrote um, an extensive annotation manual that we gave to some student annotators. So it's expert annotators with a bit of training, um, but we don't label it ourselves. And I just basically also accept what I get from the annotators <laughs> with this manual. But this is how we did it. Um, so what are the main differences here? One thing is, um, does the verb express an event or a state? And of course, maybe not surprisingly, all of these things that we found were already researched, mainly in linguistics, some of them not so much in computational linguistics. So this is the question of aspectual class. There will be more details on this in a minute. The second thing is, um, does something happen regularly or just once? Um, so Mary often feeds uh, the cats is a regular thing. Mary fed the cats is a one-time event. And that's um, called habituality or habitual sentences. Where the verb itself just expresses the regularity. So it's also uh, treated as an operator in aspect, basically. Um, 
And the last thing is, does the sentence talk about a particular referent or does it talk about a kind or class? So Mary is someone particular and cats are a kind or class. And by referent, here we talk about the main referent. Um, Carlota Smith has a lot of details what the main referent is. And we simplified this and said in English it's usually the subject that the sentence makes a statement about. This might work less well for other languages. We've looked a bit at German where it already gets more difficult. But for English it works pretty well because the subject is usually the topic of the sentence. Okay, and this has been researched under the term of genericity. So in the, in the remainder of the talk, I'll talk about these three topics um, separately because we try to model them computationally, respectively. Okay, so using these three different decisions, uh, we came up with a decision tree which helped annotators a lot to understand this scheme. And the first question is, is the main referent generic or non-generic? So as I said, this is the subject. Um, something non-generic would be Simba, something generic would be lions in general. The next question we ask the annotators, think about whether the event, uh, sorry, whether the verb expresses an event or a state. And that um, is called also dynamic or stative. So dynamic are eventive verbs that express events. Stative are the state verbs. Like win is dynamic. Something happens after you won something. The world has changed. And if you like something, it doesn't really change. Next, think about does it happen once or does it happen regularly? This is habituality. If it happens once, we call it episodic, and it results in the situation entity type event. So Simba won the game. If the annotators read a sentence like this, they say, ah, this is non-generic. Win is event or dynamic, and it happens once, so it's an event. So they assign the situation entity type label of event, but we also ask the annotators to assign those three other labels. So we can kind of trace where they get something wrong. And when, especially in the training phase, when you have new annotators, to be able to trace down the arrows to, ah, I need to remind this annotator what a special class is. That was very useful. And also later to see what works better and less well. Turns out the most difficult distinction is the one of genericity. Maybe not surprising to many of you. Okay, but let's follow this tree a bit further. If something happens regularly, like Simba usually wins, that becomes a generalizing sentence. So we have, again, Simba um, wins, but this happens regularly, so it's habitual, and we get a generalizing sentence. If it's stative, something like Simba likes Nala, we tell them, okay, you get here because it's stative, and this is actually static because it's not episodic and it's not habitual, so we introduce another label just as a placeholder for other things. So that would be a state in the scheme. Then, um, also stage of things can happen regularly. Um, Simba is often hungry. It's not a one-time state, and that was often neglected by previous work in this, and it's not so frequent, but it does happen. Um, Sim Simba is often hungry. This is also a generalizing sentence. So now we get to the part of the tree about the generic main reference. So we have lions, and a sentence like lions like butterflies, if it's stative, then they don't need to think anymore. It will be a generic sentence. You could further classify this, but for the sake of classifying situation entities, we don't need any more. So we have the stative case here. But if it's dynamic, the annotators need to think a bit more. Again, if it's habitual, it is a generic sentence. Lions chase butterflies. And now there is a very interesting case where the subject is generic. It's a dynamic verb but it's episodic. The textbook example is dinosaurs died out. So it refers to the class, but it doesn't make a general statement. It's like a one-time event, basically. I found many interesting examples, actually, when we analyzed Wikipedia data. So the, one of the most interesting ones was um, the blobfish was voted the most ugly animal, <laughs> something like that. So you do find these cases, actually. They are not so frequent, I think, in the Wikipedia data, maybe 5%, but I think that's something, so that needs to be addressed. So this is the tree um, that we explained to the annotators with all these different cases and many examples, because obviously I showed you the easy ones here, um, but it helped a lot to 
also keep annotators motivated to understand this because if you put this complex scheme in just a PDF document, that's going to frustrate the annotators. So they also do not necessarily have to follow the tree. So we don't ask this in the format of a tree. So if they feel they just want to, they see immediately, ah, this is the state, they can annotate this the other way around. Um, they are not forced to follow this tree, but it's a helpful tool for them. Okay, um, the theory is even a little bit more complicated because there is coercion. Um, there's some work on this also by Mönz and Steepman earlier. Um, it's just some linguistic phenomena would coerce events to state. So and by events, I mean when you follow our tree. You end up at event, but it's actually a state. And these are negation, modality, future, perfect, conditionality, and subjectivity. The perfect is specific to English. So in English, um, perfect expresses states. But in other languages, especially in German, this is not necessarily the case. So things like Susie will feed the cats. Susie has not fed the cats. If Susie has forgotten the cats, they might be hungry now. Um, these are all states in our theory, although they have dynamic words. Um, but this doesn't apply to general statives. So if we have Susie never feeds Mary's cats, we still label this as generalizing. If we have cats might be the most popular pet, we also label this as a generic sentence. They don't become states because they are defined by making statements about a class or kind, which this sentence still does. And this is a generalization over situations, over events, which this one also still says. So this says in any relevant situation, Susie will not feed the cats. So that's why we still label this as generics. If you want more details, I'm happy to talk about them. Um, so, but in the tree, this is not that difficult, actually. We just say, if you end up after analyzing a sentence, if you end up here, but then you find a modal or a negation, it will be a state. So if you have something like Simba didn't win today, you say it's Simba win um, once, but actually it's negated, so I end up here. And if you already ended up at generalizing or generic, you just stay there. So Simba doesn't always win as generalizing, and cats might be the most popular pet is still generic. So with this additional things in the tree, we got away pretty well. Okay. So for data sets, um, we worked with MASK, the manually annotated subcorpus of the Open American National Corpus, which has the advantage that it already has a lot of other um, semantic and syntactic annotations, gold standard, so this could be useful for um, doing some further studies. Um, and it has text from, I think, 15 or 20 different genres that we used. So it's quite nice because you don't just do it on news, but you have many different things, like, among others, essays, letters, fictions, technical, travel, news, so really everything there. And the only thing it doesn't have is encyclopedic text, but that's easy. So we just got a couple of texts from Wikipedia, and we categorized them for different um, well, categories, and we tried to mix it a bit. So we would have different categories, some from botany, animals, but also biographies, which have more particular events. But because botany or animals will have a lot of generics, so we try to mix it a bit. So we segment these texts using spade, which is a discourse parser. So we wanted to have clauses, and this was a good enough substitute for clause splitting because that's its own research field as well. And once we have these clauses, uh, hello, <laughs> uh, the annotators will label the situation entity type, the genericity of the main referent, which is the subject, the lexical aspect to a class of the main verb, and the habituality of the main verb. So here I should say that uh, we do not mark the main verb or the subject. We just show them the clause. And these are all annotators which have some training in either linguistics or computational linguistics. So it's actually very trivial for them to identify the main verb and its subject. So that's actually not an issue. And if I later run uh, like Stanford parser and extract the main verb and the subject automatically, this overlaps in 98 or 99% of the time anyways. So this is, was a simple approach. Um, in the future, I'm thinking to actually maybe not label clauses, but actually verbs, because that seems also a good approach. But at that time, we just followed previous work and didn't think much about this, but it both works. 
So for each, uh, uh, for each um, document, we have three annotators that label the data. Um, they got a training on documents that are not included in the corpus or in the agreement numbers, where we just give them some feedback and saw whether everything worked. And um, the gold standard for each document is then simply created by the majority vote from the labels of the over three annotators. Um, and with very few exceptions, we actually end up with a label that makes sense <laughs> in those cases. So we do get noise, the agreement numbers aren't perfect, but I strongly believe that this majority vote filters out a lot of the noise already, except for maybe the very difficult documents. Um, so we do this majority vote actually for all of these things here, for all of the labels. So for situation two types, also for lexical aspects for class, and so on. Um, because the segmentation is automatic, and sometimes in the texts you have headlines or things like that, which aren't really evoking any situation. So um, we also tell the annotators they can label something as this isn't actually something I want to give a label for. And in the Wikipedia data, those were about 10% of the segments, because you have a lot of lists also in Wikipedia. And it's less in mask. I think in mask it's only about 5%. And I'm showing the numbers for Wikipedia here because I'm still working on getting the numbers for mask ready and uh, having annotators finish the last couple of documents. Um, but the, the Wikipedia data is ready. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, it's a web-based annotation tool. Annot annotators see the segments here and then they mark the situation entity type. They can mark uh, the main reference uh, as actual class and habituality. And they can also say, I cannot decide here, because I want, uh, rather than to give a random choice, I'd rather have the annotator say, sorry, <laughs> I, I don't know here. Um, yeah, this is. Okay, so the, about the agreement, as I said, I present this for the Wikipedia data here, mask is in progress. Um, because we have three annotators for each document, I'm showing this um, in Fly's Kappa which is just a generalization of Cohen's kappa, so you just see how many pairwise annotations overlap. And for the features, uh, we get the following numbers. For a spectral class, stative, dynamic, and we also have this third label, like both, which I'm not so sure about more. They labeled a lot of things like this is considered as, which I believe now should actually be stative, but these kind of things evolve <laughs> once you work on the actual data. Um, we get Fly's kappa of uh, 0.65. On mask, I observed this was slightly higher, usually 0.7. So somehow it's harder here. Uh, main referent as generic, non-generic, or can't decide um, gets 0.7. And habituality um, 0.61 for episodic, static, or habitual. Um, also slightly higher for um, the mask data. Um, so all of this agreement is basically substantial. And for the situation entity types, I want to show you the Krippendorf's diagnostics because I think they are more informative than just the kappa numbers. And this means you collapse all the different types into one artificial category, except for the one that you're looking at. And the higher this number is, the better annotators can distinguish this category from all the others. And I think this is very interesting. And now we get back to your earlier question of these <laughs> different types. So here I looked at eventuality, general status, abstract entities, and speech acts. Um, so if something was given a double label as abstract entity and something else, I would treat it as abstract entity here. And all categories get a Fly's kappa of 0.67, which I, I think kappa numbers are never comparable actually, but it kind of says the annotations are more consistent than this earlier approach from 2007 here. So eventualities are good, general status are good, speech acts are very easy to be identified. Abstract entities, there's obviously a problem and this is recall. Some annotators simply forget to mark this all the time because you need to recognize that something is a verb that invokes a fact or a proposition and I don't know what to do, annotators just forget that. And I thought to pre-label this but then I'm just having annotators label what I marked previously which doesn't make sense either. So. We just have a lack of recall here. And in constructing the gold standard, what we did is more or less, if at least one annotator labeled something as an abstract entity, it will usually actually be an abstract entity, so we just use that. So different type of majority voting here. Um, 
Then for, uh, so like I said, things can be labeled twice. I was actually planning to say that only here, but you already spotted this. Um, so the basic level types is if I just abstract away from abstract entities and use those labels. So it's state, event, generic sentence, generalizing sentence, and speech acts. And what we find here is that also all categories get 0.65. Um, events and generic sentences have good kappas. Again, of course, speech acts are high. Um, state is lower because it gets confused a lot with generics. Um, this is really just a question of whether something refers to a kind or not, which is not easy. And generalizing sentences have lower scores, um, and this is actually because they aren't that frequent in Wikipedia. So if you have something that's really not frequent in your data, it's also always more difficult to get a higher kappa score. But also there's some disagreement here, obviously. So finally, um, we wanted to model discourse modes, which is why we started working on this. But uh, these are actually also relevant for other areas in NLP. So like I said, we want to identify the discourse modes of a passage. Um, but there are many other subtasks in computational um, linguistics where no large data sets were available previously. So we found usually some paper that has worked in this area, but either the data set was not available anymore or there just wasn't a big data set. It was very tiny or focused only on part of this task. So there is interest, but there weren't any data sets, but now we have the big data sets and they will all be released next year. Um, so one thing is the automatic classification of fundamental as spectral class, on which Eric Siegel had done his PhD with Kathy McEwen. Um, the idea is here to improve temporal discourse processing, where there has a little, been a little bit of work the last one actually for Portuguese, not for English yet. Um, there has been work on identifying generic noun phrases. Uh, this is also related um, or interesting for people working on co-reference resolution. I think Anya has written the, a nice survey <laughs> about this issue. Um, and identifying habitual versus episodic sentences. And in the work I present now, we build on these approaches here. Okay. So for getting to the computational modeling of situation entity types, uh, we actually want to use entire documents segmented into clauses as input. So we do not classify separated sentences, of course, but entire documents. And we want to automatically get the situation types. This is, as I said, ongoing work, but I present some um, intermediate results later. For doing that, we need to answer the following questions. Is the main referent generic? What's the lexical or spectral class of the verb? And we need to recognize habituals. So these are the things that annotators need to solve, which we now want to solve computationally. And I'll talk about these in turns now. We'll start with genericity. Um, Caloria Smith herself cites this book. Uh, it's the Introduction to Genericity by Krivka et al., which give a really nice overview over all these things. Um, in a nutshell, some NPs can be kind referring, and we only look at subjects, which makes our life somewhat easier. Um, like lions are dangerous would be generic or referring to a kind. Um, it refers to this concept of lions for the class lion, so to speak. And the non-generic cases are the particular ones like Mufasa or Zimba. This is important because you would have different entailment properties. If you know that lions are dangerous, you can say that Mufasa is dangerous, but obviously if you recognize that a sentence is non-generic, you cannot do this. You can say if Mufasa is dangerous, Simba is also dangerous. And of course, this way doesn't work either. Um, this can also be relevant for information or event extraction. So those people who want to extract events actually want to exclude these cases. If they go through a document and can say, that's generic, then they usually don't want to extract any event information from this or the other way around. If you want to get, um, acquire knowledge from text, you want to say, I might not be interested in Simba as dangerous. I want to extract information like line is dangerous, or at the very least, I want to distinguish these two types of knowledge. Um, this is all work that hasn't really been completely solved in computational linguistics, but there's a lot of um, theoretical work on this, and hopefully in the next few years we'll see more advances here. Okay, um, this is not completely trivial to recognize whether an NP refers to uh, an, 
is counterfeiting or not, because in English, at least all different types of NPs in the surface can be either counterfeiting or not. So you could have indefinite NPs, like lions eat meat, and here lions refers to a kind, but you could have something like dogs were barking outside, and this doesn't refer to all the dogs. It refers to some dogs outside, and it's actually called non-specific because you don't know which dogs. It's not a particular dog you're talking about, just some dogs. But it's definitely not referring to the kind of dogs. It doesn't make a statement about all dogs. And yeah, so there are many different types. So just looking at the NP is not sufficient in English. You really need to look at the context. So the type of clause that's employed matters here. So that's what we're trying to model. The previous data that was available here, um, this is actually the only task where a large data set was available from ACE. Uh, they were the Cobra ACE2 and ACE2005, which were annotated with NP level generosity, um, about 40,000 NPs. And they have three labels. They have um, specific, which is actually what we call non-generic. They have generic, and they have underspecified. And this underspecified label actually is very, very tricky, as we found when we looked at the data, because it really makes all the annotations not, not, not consistent, because it's not really clear what this should be. Annotators use this in uh, weird ways sometimes. Um, if, you're more, if you're interested, um, I can refer you to this, or we can talk about examples later. But this was the basis for the previous computational work in this area by Niels Reiter and Annette Frank. They wanted to identify generic noun phrases and use this data. What they did is just to extract some noun phrase-based features from the subject of a clause, also some clause-based features, then they fed this into a Bayesian network, and then they got some results. So this was the work that was previously available. And we kind of follow this architecture to some extent. Um, first of all, I re-implemented all of these features because their system was based, partially based on non-publicly available parsers and so on. So if you want to get something out in the research community, it needs to be based on some stand, like publicly available things. So this is um, now based completely on Stanford Core NLP and is available on GitHub also. So anyone can just download those features, syntactic semantic ones, and it might also soon be integrated in DK Pro, so people can just use the same features and compare to our system. Okay, so we have some NP-based features, like the bear, where it's a bare plural. Um, we have countability from the Silex database, so this is always, it's not, well, it, it's usually correct, whether it's a countable noun or not. Um, for the clause-based features, they relate to the head of the clause, so the main verb. Um, What's the voice? Is it active, passive? Is it perfective? And so on. So the main difference of our work versus this previous work by Reiter and Frank is that we said, well, we are classifying entire documents, and maybe sometimes it's not enough to just look at one clause to decide on the genericity. So if you have this document here, um, which is actually from Wikipedia, sugar maples also have a tendency to color unevenly in fall. The recent year's growth twigs are green and turn dark brown. So if you have only the second sentence, if I just give this to an annotator, even a human, they would have no idea to whether they should label this generic or not, because it could refer to the sugar maple class or kind of tree, but it could also refer to a particular tree, like this is the tree in front of my house, the recent year's growth tricks are green and just now turn dark brown. So you can't actually tell what this is without the context. But if you have a previous sentence, like sugar maples, and you know here that sugar maples is generic, you also know that the second sentence should be generic. So this was our intuition here, that we should really look at entire documents, and what we classify in this work is really the subject in an entire document. So we treat the genericity labeling of the noun phrases. Well, for ACE, we look at all the noun phrases. For the Wikipedia data, we only have labels for subjects. Um, and we treat this as a sequence labeling task, not just as a classification task. So how does this work? Technically, uh, we have a sequence of clauses, which is the entire documents. And we extract some features. These are the syntactic semantic features from earlier. 
So we just say this feature is present or not, basically. And then uh, we feed them into a conditional random field, which is just a sequence labeling technique, and that will output a sequence of labels that get the best score for this sequence of sentences. So we really put in entire documents. We also tried passages only, but it didn't give any improvement. So um, more mathematically, um, without getting in too much details here, uh, we have this observation sequence with all the features for the different clauses, and we have a label sequence. And the first description in this model will be feature functions, and we call them unigram feature functions, following the technology of uh, the terminology of the toolkit that we use. And they describe how likely is the label generic for the features that I see here. So what are the kind of observation here? Like, and this is, again, like these features from earlier. Is it active? Is it a bare plural? And so on. Um, so what's, how likely is it to see this label? So this would be a simple classifier, like maximum entropy. I just say how likely are these features given a certain label, oh, no, how, how likely is the label given these features, basically. And the CRF now adds these functions. How likely is it to see this label if I've seen this label before? And then the score will actually be computed for this entire function here. So the probability of the label sequence given an observation sequence is very roughly this. We just sum over all the feature functions here, the values of those, and what we need to learn is the lambda, is the weights. And I'm not talking about learning here because that just can be done by the toolkit. You just tell it, use this learning algorithm and it outputs the weights in a classifier for you. Um, but if there are more questions, I have some backup slides if you're interested in more formulas. But Maybe um, it's not so relevant. Okay, so these are the results that we get for the ACE data. So the majority class um, here is specific for ACE. So the most of, because it's news data, most of the cases are actually not class referring. So you have the majority class of um, around 90% for ACE2, where they only have two labels. They don't have USP and ACE2. They have it here, so the majority class is a little lower. And the previous work of Reiter and Frank, actually, if you just look at the accuracy in this setting, is lower than the majority class. They use the Bayesian network. If you feed the exact same features into the maximum entropy model, so this is the Unicram model, when we don't use these transition functions, it's really just maximum entropy, um, we actually get already better than the majority class. But this is not so exciting. It's just a better uh, machine learning technique in this case. If we add the bigram functions, it gets a little bit better. And if I add the bigram functions, but I give the model the correct previous label, so I pretend that each previous decision was correct, then it actually gets significantly better. So that means actually this intuition that this course should help is not wrong. But something is still not quite satisfying here because we should see this improvement also if we do not give gold standard information in there. But when we looked at the data, we found, A, there are almost, well, I think very few generic instances in this data, which makes it hard to classify them. And there's also something wrong with the annotation. So even in the annotation guidelines, you have some problems. And um, specifically, uh, they mix generosity and specificity. Generosity is whether something refers to a kind, which is what they wanted to annotate, and specificity is whether I know the identity of the thing I'm talking about. So if I know, if I talk the coffee I had earlier with Jan and Anna, I'm talking about a particular coffee. I think if I say um, we should, I, I want to have a coffee later, I'm not talking about a particular coffee, I'm just talking about some coffee. Um, and they have really, they mix this up. So they have in the annotation guidelines, they say officials reported should be classified as underspecified. But we say it's actually not. Um, it's definitely not generic because it does not refer to the, it doesn't make a statement about all officials, but it's non-specific because I don't know which official said something. So we say this should have been labeled as specific. And there are many such cases in the data. So a specific in the terminology of them. So in our terminology, non-generic. Um, but if you have these kind of inconsistencies, even in the manual, there might be some difficulties if you're trying to learn something there also. 
Um, and I talked to the people at LDC and they basically agreed and said, yeah, in the next iteration, hopefully they can fix um, a couple of things there. Okay, but we also have the Wikipedia data, which we really annotated according to genericity only. And here we see some interesting results. So majority class is much lower. It's um, generic, I think, actually, here in the Wikipedia data. Um, the Bayesian network outperforms this already, which is what you would expect. It's actually weird that it goes so much down in the other case. When we use the Unigram, like the maximum entropy, it's much better than the Bayesian network again. Um, if we use the bigram functions, we get an improvement of 3%, which is highly significant here, and which means that even if we don't have gold standard information, this, this course intuition actually works. And if I add the bigram gold information here as well, it goes even more up. So hopefully we will find even better ways to leverage the discourse context in the future. Um, but this really showed that this, this intuition helped somehow. Okay. That was um, the part on generosity. Are there any questions right now? Okay, so actually we can identify the generosity of the main referent with about 80% accuracy, which I think is actually quite nice. So hopefully we can use this to identify um, situation entity types later. Okay, next step, lexical or spectral class. So um, to remind you, lexical or spectral class is about whether a verb is dynamic, expresses an event, like she filled the glass with juice, expresses the event, or stative, juice fills the glass, is a state. And actually, we also have clauses where annotators can't really decide, even with the context, you can get both interpretations. So when we did this research a year ago, we allowed them to label both. And I'm not so sure about this decision anymore, as I said, but it's there and there are cases that are just difficult to label. So maybe you want to think of this just as annotators weren't sure cases. Um, and there has been a lot of work in linguistics before on this. Um, for instance, Wendler's time schemata of verbs. So he said, I want to assign one of the aktionsarten to, wor to verbs. And here the basic distinction is states versus all these things starting with an A, activities, accomplishments, achievements. Um, but the basic distinction that you need to make first is, is it stative or dynamic here? Um, the differences here are whether it has an endpoint and so on, or a culmination and so on. Um, but we look at first making this distinction and then this could be done later as a second step. Then Bach a bit later said, well, actually, we can't really assign this to verb types because such as, in cases such as fill, you can't actually assign this because maybe sometimes fill is this, maybe sometimes fill is that. So he said we need to assign this to sentences, which is what we also do, or we use clauses. And his eventuality types are organized in a tree. You have state and non-states, and non-states are things like processes and events. So process would be something like she is running because it doesn't have a natural um, endpoint, so the activities of Wendler. Um, but again, this tree goes on with many other different types, what is, but again, the most fundamental distinction is the one between state and non-state. So this is what we try to model here. Um, so Siegel and McEwen introduced already the task of labeling fundamental lexical or spectral class. Um, something like John will love this cake is stative. Um, or because we, what we try to predict is the word sense, basically, here, of John love cake. John will love cake, as I said earlier, is then somehow coerced again but we don't model this here. This is really at the word sense level, it's not at the class level, what we label. Um, it's more important for dynamic cases, like um, John has kissed Mary, so something is dynamic, kissing is Mary, uh, kissing, Mary is dynamic. Uh, John has kissed Mary in English is the entire clause is actually static, it's a state, because the English perfect has been shown to behave like states in text. It focuses on the result, like this has happened, basically. Um, but what we want to label here is John kiss Mary, which should be dynamic. So Siegel and McEwen, I think, had a really cool idea. They used so-called linguistic indicator features. They used a large parse text corpus, in this case, Gigavert. And, uh, oh, sorry, we used Gigavert, they used something else. So we just 
did some dependency parsing on that, and then for certain linguistic indicators, namely exactly those, uh, they count how often each verb occurs with these indicators in the parsed corpus. So with some simple rules, you can count for each verb type how often occur it occurs in the future, with no subject, with a temporal adverb. So these are all informations that you can simply extract from this parsed corpus. And that basically gives you the behavior of a verb type over a large corpus, like some kind of profile of verb usage. So for instance, you can have the verb type drink. So for drink, one feature could be the linguistic indicator feature for past tense gets a value such as 0 0.0927, and that really just means that 9.27% of all instances of drink in the corpus are in past tense and you get this kind of statistics for each of the indicators for all of your verb types. So for each uh, verb type, you have 15 features. And they are really nice, they work really nicely as we found. Um, the original data was not available unfortunately, and Eric Siegel just emailed me and said, ah, that was small, annotate your own data set, so that's what we did. And our data set is also available. Um, if you have a sentence like, she filled the class with juice, what you do is you just get all the features for fill here. You feed them into a classifier. We use the random forest classifier here. And you train this classifier on a lot of cases that have labels, for which you can also just get the linguistic indicators. And then you get a label, like it's dynamic. Uh, the problem is, if you have a sentence like the glass is filled with juice, you do exactly the same thing. You get the same features. You give this to your classifier and the classifier outputs dynamic. So obviously this will output the same label uh, for each sentence that uses a particular verb because the features are all type-based. Um, so the classification will always result in the majority class of the verb type. So that itself is maybe not so interesting because you could just use the majority class of this verb type in your label data. Um, and the data set wasn't available, as I said. So Alexis and I took this work a step further. We labeled here 6,000 clauses from mask, incomplete text, then we got a kappa of 0.7 and used this for the experiments. Uh, the first experiment, which was really just something that uh, they hadn't done, but which I found really interesting, is to look at unseen verbs. So this is a particular cross-validation setting. So we use tenfold cross-validation, but I make sure that all the instances of one verb are in one fold. So this means when you classify, you pretend that you've not seen any instances of this verb in your training data, which might happen in real life. So then the majority class is just the majority class of the entire data set, which is 73% um, dynamic instances here. But if you use these linguistic indicator features, the accuracy goes up to 80. And that's really interesting because it means that these linguistic indicators generalize across verb types. So even if you haven't seen a verb, you, get, you guess the majority class from similar verbs that you've seen, and it helps. So I think that was actually interesting to see, that they can be really useful in that case. Are there any questions on this? Okay. So additionally, we said, well, if we want to distinguish these two cases, we need something else. We need instance-based features. So we really need um, some features for the actual sentence and feed them into the classifier additionally, because otherwise we'll never be able to distinguish those two. Um, this is what we uh, did. We had, an, so I presented, I, I can't show you all the results here today, so there are many more in the paper. If you're interested, please ask me. Uh, here I'm presenting results for about uh, 2,600 sentences from the Brown corpus, which we, uh, are actually only for 20 verbs that often take on different classes, or where, where we expected that they would take on different classes after annotation had looked a bit differently. Um, and here it's really just relief one out cross-validation because there were so few instances. Um, here is the overall results. So if we use the majority class or if we use the linguistic indicators, in each case this would be the same result, namely 66% accuracy. If we add the instance-based features, it goes up to 71%. So for these verbs, really, you need the context for each sentence because only the verb type doesn't help. Um, if you use the instance-based features on their own, which is what some reviewers asked, if you only use instance-based features, 
uh, like, do you even need linguistic indicators was their question. And yes, we do need them. Then it goes really below majority class. So only looking at the context isn't helpful. We need some kind of type information here as well. Um, yeah, this is what I just said. Uh, this is the results per verb. So the blue line is the majority class for the verb. And so when we have a high majority class, adding the instance-based features doesn't really help. But as soon as the majority class goes down, you can see the, uh, the yellow line, which is the uh, system, go up the blue line, which means here, if majority class is lower, they help. And you usually have the case if you have a high majority class in your data set, it's high to improve up this, uh, upon this because the classifier is just biased a bit. Um, if you're wondering about hold, why this is so much worse, uh, I looked into this and I think it's a mistake in the annotation partially. Some annotators annotated some weird things. It's also one of the verbs that where really the majority class was, I can't decide. So apparently something went wrong in annotation here. Okay. Uh, but the more ambiguous the verb type, the more often it has, the more meanings it can take on, the more important it is to model the word sense here. Okay, so finally, um, we did some work on recognizing habituality because we needed to identify the habituals as well. Uh, there was some previous work on this by Thomas Matthew and Graham Katz, uh, but they only looked at dynamic verbs. So they said, um, episodic is a particular event, like John went swimming yesterday, and habituals are generalizations over situations, which also tolerate exceptions. Um, like Bill often goes swimming, could also be lions usually eat meat. You could still have a lion that doesn't eat meat or on a particular day didn't eat meat or something like this. Um, and they did this for those two cases. So looking at dynamic verbs, using some sentences from uh, the pen tree bank, and actually only using gold standard based features. So then Manfred and I started wondering, when you try to label full texts, you also have those cases, like Bill likes coffee, Bill didn't go swimming, Bill can swim. We're like, but none of these labels actually fits there. And we wanted to label full texts. So, um, Matthew and Katz had actually selected some sentences. Um, but you need to model the full phenomenon somehow if you want to label full text. So this is what we did. Um, we had a paper on the three-way classification of clausal aspect. And I believe this is really just the first step into this direction to identify habituals, um, but a necessary first step. And we hope to extend this in the future. So we have episodic. They usually have dynamic lexical aspect. Bill drank a coffee after lunch. Habitual sentences, like Bill usually drinks coffee after lunch. We have cases like Italians drink coffee after lunch that generalize over situations, but also refer to a kind. And in the Wikipedia data that I'll show you, we actually have a lot of those. Um, referring not to particular people, but actually to generalizing over kinds and situations. We also have habituals that are actually stative. Sloths sometimes sit on top of branches, so if you assume that sit is a stative verb, it generalizes, or like John is often hungry, would be one of those cases. John never drinks coffee. We also decided to label as habitual. We found, we looked into the linguistic literature and found the suggestion that this could either be treated as a state or as habitual, the never, because it's also negated. Um, but there were arguments for both sides, and we said it's easier to include this with habitual for the annotators because it clearly generalizes over situations. Um, and then we said, well, we will just lump together all the rest into a third class, namely static. Because from the point of view of the clausal aspect, they are all static. It doesn't happen repeatedly, and it doesn't happen once. It's just somehow a state. So Bill likes coffee is stative. Bill can swim is also static because it just expresses a property. Um, same for negation and in English the perfect. So they again can have different lexical aspects. And I think it would be terribly interesting to now go on and distinguish them in a computational model as well. Um, especially like modal senses are very interesting because some express an ability, other express the belief that something is the case. So we have some work with Annette Frank where we have some work on distinguishing them. I think they go on and 
she has a PhD student working on that, so filtering these out will be really interesting to go on. Okay, but now we just wanted to computational model to distinguish those three, actually with the main goal of identifying these guys here, like the habituals. Okay, um, I don't want to keep talking a lot about technical things because it's very similar to what you've seen before. We again use the same features, the instance-based features actually extracted from the clause, and we also use the linguistic indicators because also here, like, the profiles of the verbs um, prove to be useful in the end. We try two different models. One is the joint model where we simply train one classifier on the three labels to directly output one of those three labels. And we also tried a cascaded model where we first tr train a classifier to distinguish those static cases from the non-static cases. And then we say, well, the ones that weren't static, please um, identify them as hab episodic or habitual. So basically, this step can be trained um, better than here, as it turns out, because the classifier somehow gets less confused, and then it makes a better job at, at distinguishing this, because this distinction is then also trained on gold standard, obviously, and when you feed in a test item, it gets slightly better. Um, so these are the numbers. We again have the 102 text from Wikipedia um, with three annotators here. We have 60% static cases that we filter out and 20% episodic and habitual. Uh, this is the accuracy we get. Majority class is close to 60% static cases. Only using instance-based features, like just looking at the clause, gives you close to 70%. Only type-based features, only those linguistic indicators, something similar. Um, but when you combine them, it again goes up by almost 10% in accuracy, which I found really interesting because it says that verbs do have a preference how they are used. So this is basically a type-based information. And then you combine this with the class, it goes up a lot. This is what we have not seen for the lexical aspect to class, but which we see on this level, um, that really you need both informations. And the cascaded model gets a little better, especially again in this case for unseen verbs. So here this is the case when we just randomly cross-validate. This is again when I pretend I have not seen this verb type in the training data, which makes the task a little harder. And here this actually went up 2% uh, in accuracy, but most interestingly, when you look at the F-scores in this case, the F-score for the habitual class goes up a lot. So this improvement in accuracy actually means um, that the model was really better at distinguishing episodic and habituals in the second step because it probably got better training data for that. It's my assumption here. Um, yeah, so if you use this cascaded model, we actually are better at identifying habituals in free text. I also need to improve this even further. <laughs> I mean, it's not so bad, but I would like to get um, a higher score for the habituals as well here. Maybe if I get more data from MASK, this could be useful. Okay, so finally, uh, the automatic classification of situation entity types, which is really ongoing work that I'm doing mainly with Alexis Palmer. And um, I should tell you about the distribution of the situation entity types in Wikipedia first. So we have a lot of generic sentences. Actually, half of this data was labeled as generic. We have only few generalizing ones, and we have a lot of states and events. Um, and we have very few abstract entities, so actually, and also speech acts. So I haven't uh, looked at these yet, but they occur more often in the mask data, so that is, will be more interesting. But Wikipedia was also a corpus that we compiled primarily to like, see how well we can identify generics and so on. So we needed more of them. So um, I present these results for a development set because I wanted to use some data as holdout data. So we have only 8,000 uh, clauses here. And uh, I use states, events, generic sentences, and generalizing sentences for these experiments to see how well we can distinguish them. These are the accuracies we get. So the majority class is 58% states. And these models here then always add the features. So here it's post text and words only. Then we add some de syntactic semantic features, and this is basically maximum entropy model. So we get quite promising results already, um, improving a lot over the baseline. When I add these bigrams again, uh, it improves a little. When I pretend I know the previous situation entity type, it goes up again. 
so these are really preliminary results and I hope to at least get above 80 <laughs> after um, the full classification. So um, what's interesting, I think, is actually confusion matrix, maybe more than all these other numbers. So what we can see is that um, events are easily identified. That's the same in the manual annotation. It's very easy to say, ah, this happened. I assign event. Uh, we get some confusion between states and generic sentences, which we also see in the manual annotation, and very often it is really hard to decide whether something refers to a class or still just a very large set, like the students at Prague University. Is that a set of people, a particular non-generic set of people, or is it a class? And it might really may depend on the context here, whether it is the one or the other. Um, and generalizing sentences obviously is not perfect, but we ha don't have many of these. Um, so that might also be a problem. Okay, so for generalizing sentence, maybe we just don't have enough data yet, but they occur actually more in fiction or something, like she went to school every morning or something like this, so it might be more interesting there. And we have uh, the same confusions that we also observed in manual annotation, so this might just be something that's in the data. Okay. So ongoing and future work is uh, the identification of abstract entities, which might just need some separate rules, uh, more relevant probably for the mask data. Identification of speech acts. Um, on some preliminary experiment, I saw that at least imperatives can easily be identified by uh, just the post tags, and so this needs to be integrated as a first step. Um, I want to investigate the interaction of the prediction of the features, namely main reference and clausal aspect in the situation entity types, because much of the features that I use in either task um, cover the same things, which is what I want actually, but I need to like, quantify how much and, and which features in which situation. I want to investigate the impact of the different genres and domains using mask, like how much knowledge about situation entities transfers across domains. Um, we want to create models for labeling situation entity types and the discourse modes, obviously. This is uh, specifically with Alexis. Um, and we want to integrate the situation entity type information in computational models of discourse, um, namely the identification of coherence relations. So Vera Demberg's group in Saarbrücken is working on this. So hopefully uh, we can, inter oh, not hopefully, we are working on integrating this. Um, or also temporal processing where some people at Brandeis, for instance, are working on. So to see how these features benefit other tasks in natural language processing. Okay, now to summarize, um, we are trying to uh, do the groundwork for computational models of a new approach to discourse analysis, uh, which is complementary to existing approaches to discourse, um, such as rhetorical structure theory, um, the Pen or Prague Discourse Tree Bank, um, or SDRT, where people focus on relations between clauses. So we don't look at the relations between clauses, but we looked at what type of passage is this? And maybe this can even benefit from each other, like if you know certain relations or you know the passage, and I think this would be really interesting to complement the levels of discourse analysis that we have. Mm. We have already worked on computational modeling of various aspectual distinctions, habituality and lexical aspectual class. Um, they should be useful for other text understanding tasks. Uh, we have worked on the recognition of genericity, which could also be useful for knowledge acquisition. And these aspectual distinctions um, define how the different types of clauses contribute to the structure of the discourse. So this is really Kaloda Smith's ideas, like discourse and aspect on a clause level interact. So you can't treat them completely separately, but in order to analyze, like the temporal structure of clauses, you need to know the discourse mode, or to find out the discourse mode, you need to know what types of clauses exist here. So this is why we did all this labeling, because we think it's again related and going back to discourse modes. And we actually started also labeling English texts with discourse modes, um, and then want to train models for both. So finally, I want to thank you all for coming, and also show again my co-authors on all these papers. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you very much for a talk. It was very, very interesting in many different respects. I have a lot of questions to different <laughs> parts of the, your talk, but it was so comprehensive that possibly some of them I will ask later. What I wanted to say concerning uh, the theory, uh, as you uh, told at the end of the talk, actually on this slide, um, you, um, as uh, um, I'm not sure, Carola Smith, she's working with SDRT, uh, SDRT isn't she? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. so your your text you're analyzing using a little bit your types uh, uh, are they somehow intersected? Uh, are they I think she even offers like an implementation of them in DRT. So uh -huh. um, she has some rules and so on that you could apply, um, but they they wouldn't work compu in a computational model. So that's why we approached mm -hmm. this more from a feature learning based approach, but. Uh, there is, I think, an entire chapter on this in her book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. And one more, uh, one more thing also about theories. Um, in uh, Penn Tree Bank, uh, Ani Nenkova is working on uh, uh, recognizing generic sentences. Uh, is your study somehow connected with your uh, with your experiments, or so is it? You're referring to that recognizing general and specific sentences, yes. right? Yeah. Spec yeah. Specific teller, you're here yeah. To, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so she's actually not really recognizing generic sentences in the way that we do, like generic as kind reference, which is really grounded in the linguistic theory or semantic theory. Uh, what she's doing is, I think, more pragmatic. So she looks at what she calls general or specific. Um, is completely, uh, sorry, it's, it's not, you can't classify one as generic and the other not. So she just says the more details a sentence has, then it's specific. If it has less details and is a bit more vague, it's general. But you could have something that would I would classify as non-generic as a general sentence in her case. Yeah, you could say President Obama is working on new implementations of Medicare or something like this, and that in her um, annotation scheme would be general, but in my case it would not be. And specific would in her case be on December 5th, uh, Obama passed a new law on this and this, so that's, this would be specific in her case. And um, the more I thought about this, the more I felt we maybe need something intermediate or something that covers both, because for some um, for some distinctions, I think maybe just following the semantic theory is a bit strict because we have some things that we ended up classifying maybe as states, but which express some kind of common knowledge, where I felt we maybe need something a bit more in the direction of, does it express some background knowledge? Um, this would be a completely different annotation scheme. So we started with genericity um, in the strict sense, because we just wanted to model this linguistic phenomenon also. For applications, like I said, I feel like we might have to broaden this a bit. Um, but also, I mean, Annie is basing her um, annotations, well, not annotation scheme, the data was from uh, the Penn Discourse Tree Bank. So they used the instantiation relations and set, which have uh, the annotation scheme. Something is um, an example of something else. And they use this as training data. Mm -hmm. And so this isn't already very clearly defined. Um, so it's an approximation that's useful maybe for some tasks, um, but this is, I think, the, the main difference towards our, or compared to our work. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, could I have one more, one more little, or possibly later? <laughs> <laughs> Continue. Okay, uh, the last one. Uh, I liked very much you're using um, this coercion from events to states uh, when you have uh, uh, identifying different kinds of uh, uh, um, uh, situation entities. Uh, so when you, you when you have modality, negation, and other other uh, features, then you switch from class to class. Didn't you try that for identifying genericity somehow? So when you uh, when you then uh, um, identified three classes of generic, non non generic, and this uh, and this problematic class, non specific, non generic. If uh, if 
something like possibly something like that scheme could help to switch from generic to non-generic. Uh, so if you have a non-generic, uh, if you have a specific sentence, so Mary uh, ate a dog, and uh, then you uh, add something uh, that can be specified, for example, modality, like Mary can't eat a dog, then you switch to this kind of, to the other kind of uh, situation. So just, uh, can, did you try so, uh, some uh, such kind of schemas to generosity? I'm not sure whether I'm completely following okay. <laughs> what you mean. Yeah. So to to integrate like negation and modality even more. Integrate like integrate a, schemas like uh, switching uh, uh, co coercion schemas to uh, so, identifying generic. Yeah, so the idea was that with generosity there's uh, no coercion. So if you have a sentence like cats eat mice or cats don't eat, I don't know, butterflies, both say something about cats. So both are making statements about the class. And because we just followed Carlotta Smith there quite strictly, you don't have coercion actually, strictly speaking. It's only if you have something that, according to our um, decision tree, ends up at event. Because if you just look at these basic features, it might end up being a state in the end. Um, but I agree that we don't model a lot of things that go on within certain classes. And I'm actually thinking to um, do this as my postdoc project. So I want to wrap this up and then look at all these distinctions which I found during the annotation and all the research. Um, and actually, hopefully, next year we'll start to annotate some more fine grained phenomena uh, that will hopefully be useful. And another thing that I haven't said here, but which I want to work on more, is extending this to other languages because you can learn only so much in English. And I think it's interesting to solve some problems in English. But we've already started with uh, the right hand side Clio's master thesis to apply some of this for German and see where the differences are. And we already found that there are many things that can be transferred to a different language. Um, I would be interested to see how a lot of this works in Chinese, because therefore interpreting tense, you need aspect, because they don't have tense. So if you want to infer temporal relations, uh, you need to look at these fine-grained distinctions of aspect, whether something is bounded or not. So all of these things, I think, are very, very interesting to be modeled, and hopefully. Um, I will do that <laughs> after submitting this thesis. Yeah. Okay, thank you for very nice presentation. It must been or it's been an enormous amount of work you presented here, and uh, I have one clarification question. Or mm, so we, you uh, introduced those th three components that uh, contribute on. Recognizing situation types, yeah, or, as I understand. Yeah, these well, features like lexical aspect class yeah. and so, so on. Yeah. So, can you can we uh, look at the f uh, main results of the situation types? Because I um, I saw their features like bigrams and uh, yeah, part of speech text. Okay, so where are those features? Uh, ah, yeah, they are not here. I mean, this is uh, the ongoing research. <laughs> um, ah, okay, yeah. so you, you haven't used it yeah. yet. So the main question here would be, if I train separate models for these different tasks, do I get better? And that was actually what I was hoping. You know, mm -hmm. I trained for the separate things. Um, and when I did this preliminary experiment, I was not expecting these results. Because mm -hmm. in Alexa's previous work, when she used post tags and words, she got from a majority class to like 63% or something. Okay. So I put this into this uh, CRF and I'm like, oh wow, this is actually quite good already. <laughs> so since then I got a little bit less confident um, how well I could model these different um, other subtasks. Mm -hmm. um, I will still try because when I put in the gold standard values for those, it gets up to 97% accuracy. So if I could label these subclasses yeah. perfectly, I would get perfect accuracy. So that's why I still want to follow. If I can move up the accuracy for the types a bit, uh, sorry, for the features a bit more, mm -hmm. I might get a better accuracy. But on the other hand, maybe I just have to accept the fact that here a joint model also works well because the model also uses the same features. 
and uses the duration into the types labels and res uh, gets a good accuracy as well. Mm -hmm. um, given that we already have not so, such a bad accuracy, I guess I could live with that because I think in NLP, if you get above 80% accuracy, this could be useful for further tasks. If it's much less, it's usually not useful. Um, but this is a good observation. I mean, this is what I said. Like, yeah. I think it was on the future work yeah, yeah, slide, yeah, okay. like um, yeah. the prediction of features and the situation to and, types. And have you tried at least, uh, because at the very beginning, you show the graph of like a tree or uh, how to combine uh, those the the, the sub, sub features mm -hmm. into, into situation types. So it should be done uh, like in a rule-based manner, yeah. according to this yeah, graph. Yeah, that was the idea. Or to predict the different um, features and then learn another tree mm -hmm. and see whether this fits. So you haven't tried uh, this? like I have tried this with the gold standard yeah, values. Okay. And with the gold standard values, it works. With the uh -huh. Basically, the feature values that the annotators give. Just, just with the rule-based Yeah, rule or like also approach. with the classifier, like a tree that was yeah, learned. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, I think with the CRF. So, mm -hmm. but that only means my annotators followed my scheme. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily, and it means like I can predict that. Um, but I also wanted to see uh, what are the difficult cases which I can read off more from the confusion matrix, and you know what what is the underlying things that go on there. But this mm -hmm. is exactly, and I'm happy if anyone has ideas because I will be working on this in the next couple of months. And if anyone has ideas or even questions, I'm really happy to discuss this in the next couple of days because, yeah, this is really ongoing work. Yeah. Mm. Okay, and thank you. Mm. Thanks. Mm. There's one thing that puzzles me. Uh, one thing is puzzling for me. Uh, why, why do you merge all low facticity clauses with states? Uh, yeah, yeah, these mm -hmm. negations, models, conditionals. Uh, wouldn't it be more beneficial just to have that what really is a state and then some unmarkables? I know you said you mm -hmm. want a full yeah. text um, coverage, so you, but anyway, yeah. this, this, this makes the whole state kind of, you know. Yeah. So you uh, mean two different types of states, one that are lexically stative and then these other cases. Mm. Yeah, that's actually even possible because I do have these annotations from the annotators. So I basically can infer from the text they gave whether it's an actual state that really just came uh, this way or whether it's one of these coerced states. So I do have this in the data and maybe this is a really interesting suggestion that I could just create a label coerced states and train this in the model. I think this is actually an excellent suggestion that is not in Kalodis theory but even for computational linguists might be more useful. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. I thought about this at some point and forgot about it again, and <laughs> I think it's an excellent suggestion. And like I said before, there's so many things here that we want to even distinguish further somehow. Yeah. Okay, so, so actually to this slide, uh, is it the same for phasal verbs, like to start, to finish? Does it also belong to the coercive category? Um, we, I think, treat them as episodic dynamic verbs. Um, or like, or continue would then probably be state. We have not specified anything about aspectual verbs, which we basically just neglected to do. Um, it's on the to-do list that we should do something about them. And I think annotators just treated them somehow um, in, like they, they treat them, them as the main verb. So if they say he started to run, they label this as an event. Or they start, um, he, he stopped uh, being nice <laughs> at some point, you know. This is the question when you have a state of verb, how you want to label this. And they would label this as an event too. And I think that's okay for this theory. Um, but we also, the, the manual is already like 30 pages and there are many more things that we could include. But I guess as you probably also know is that in any annotation endeavor, you have a balance between feasibility and level of detail that you want to give to your annotators. Um, so they would still be able to memorize this. Yeah, and yeah, we, we kind of neglected to say something about this in the manual, and this is what happened. <laughs> and yeah. and just, just to make sure, if, if you are already in the, you identified a state, and then any of these coercive uh, words come, that um, stays in the state category, right? So if you already identified a state, he likes cats, mm -hmm. and then uh, it's negated. It's uh, it yeah. stays. As, yeah, as, yeah, yeah. Of course, yeah. Unless, yeah, yeah. yeah. He doesn't like uh, Nala. Would be also a state. 
Yeah, and, and the reason is just because Carlo Desmith says that states are anything that introduces properties of the world. And that this is like a catch-all class. And I think it's a great idea to split it up, actually. Okay, I think we have uh, 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 exhausted the 90 minutes. So, so thank you again for, for your talk. And I hope uh, well, the questions will continue either this afternoon or even tomorrow morning. Okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs>